Well, welcome once again to our study of the Gospel of Mark. I'm John Robbins, one of the pastors on staff at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. We are grateful for your presence once again as we continue our study of this great gospel that tells us so much about our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, let's do what we do every week now, and that is quickly go over what we dealt with last week to kind of put things in proper perspective so that we can move on today. In just a moment, we're going to begin with the 19th verse of the third chapter of the Gospel of Mark. But again, let's remind ourselves of what we dealt with last week. Now remember, Jesus confronts a man who has a withered hand. In that culture, in that day and time, people who had any kind of condition, any kind of ailment, oftentimes received very little, if any, encouragement or support from others. Generally speaking, Hebrew people believed that something that was wrong with someone physically was of their own doing, their own fault, because of some kind of grievous sin. Obviously, Jesus didn't believe that, never taught that, and proved that not to be the case by doing what he did to the man with the withered hand. And that is, he healed him. And he healed him intentionally in front of other people. And of course, some of those people are very critical that Jesus would do something like that on the Sabbath day. But we know that Jesus didn't waste time, particularly in the Gospel of Mark, where there is such a sense of urgency about Jesus' ministry. Jesus went out of his way to heal the man, to make him whole. And once again, there are those in the religious establishment who conspire, as Scripture says, to destroy him. Now, we already see in the Gospel of Mark several themes, one of which is the crowd pressing in on Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, oftentimes when Jesus travels from one point to the next, there is a large crowd following him, wanting something from him expecting him to do something for them. And so Jesus gets into a boat, separates himself from the crowd, so that they would not crush him. Now you think about the kind of people who want a part of Jesus to such a degree that there is fear on the part of the disciples and concern on the part of Jesus himself that he could be crushed in the crowd. So he separates himself from the crowd and he begins to teach. And when the unclean spirits see Jesus, they know him to be just who he is, the son of the living God. And Jesus reminds them and sternly orders them not to speak on his behalf. And then we see in Mark's gospel where he lists the 12 disciples. Disciples are those who glean information from a mentor. They learn from a teacher. Apostles in the Gospels are those who then take what it is they've learned and go and share it with the rest of the world. So oftentimes in the Gospels, the word disciple and the word apostle are used interchangeably, meaning the same group of people. Remember, all the Gospels were written several decades after Jesus has been resurrected and ascends to the Father. And so oftentimes the Gospel writers are writing about those that the people knew to be apostles because it's after the fact. So using the term disciple and apostles oftentimes is used interchangeably in the Gospels. So today we pick up with chapter 3. Some versions start with verse 19. Some versions start with verse 20. Mine starts with verse 19 of chapter 3. It says, Then Jesus went home. And the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. Now I want you to see once again what we see regarding the crowd and Jesus. The crowd we are going to see over time literally saps the energy from Jesus. They are pressing in on him. He's worried about being crushed by the crowd. And now so many people have followed him even to his own home, which is his base of operations, Capernaum in Galilee. There are so many people there that now Jesus can't even have a meal. 
He is fully human as much as he is fully God. Like all of us, he needs to eat. And there are so many people who have gathered around, Jesus is not even able to have something to eat. When his family heard it, that is the family of Jesus, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. Now this is a rather unusual text. It is what we would call today a form of intervention. Jesus' own family is concerned about him, about his well-being, for whatever reason. We don't know particularly what they've heard about Jesus. We don't know what their particular concerns are, but we do know that there is, if you will, an attempt to have an intervention with Jesus, to come into his presence. Now, notice there is no mention of the father. That is Jesus' father, Joseph. So most scholars believe that he is probably dead by now. But Jesus' family gathers around to restrain him, for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. Now remember, there are a number of reasons in why, why which people would think that Jesus is so radically different that maybe he's not who he claimed to be after all. Because he does things so differently. He's touching people he shouldn't be touching. He's com conversing with people he shouldn't be in conversation with. He's doing things that typical rabbis wouldn't do, and we're going to see that he's not done doing things that are rather unusual for a rabbi to do, at least the way Jesus does it. And so we continue to see here that there is concern for him. And it says in verse 22, And the scribes came down from Jerusalem. Now notice this. There is an official delegation that has come down from Jerusalem to determine who this man is, to try to figure him out. He is an enigmatic figure, to say the least. He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. That's the accusation against Jesus by the religious establishment, that he is the demon of all demons, Beelzebul. And when he is casting demons out of others, people will say that that means he is himself demon-possessed. And Jesus is going to fight back with that kind of accusation. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Verse 25. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand up to his end, his end has come. What Jesus says is, you're accusing me of being Satan. If I am the prince of all demons, why would I be casting demons out of other people? That doesn't make any sense. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus justifies his ministry and tries to make it abundantly clear and clarify that he is one casting out demons to bring about life. He is not demon-possessed himself. It doesn't make any sense for one who is demon-possessed to try to rid other people of their demons. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house will be plundered. Now in verse 28 it says, Truly I say to you, or my version says, Truly I tell you, which is found 13 times in the Gospel of Mark. 51 times in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, the reason I tell you this is because in the culture in which Jesus found himself in that day and time, rabbis spoke on behalf of past rabbis. In other words, what Jesus should have said, people assumed, was, Rabbi so-and-so says this. But Jesus, as a rabbi, speaks for himself. He doesn't quote past rabbis, which was the appropriate thing to do, to show past rab rabbis reverence and respect and honor by quoting what they said. Jesus doesn't do that at all. What Jesus does instead is quote himself by saying, Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. Now notice this, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. 
for they had said he has an unclean spirit. Jesus speaking for himself is unprecedented. Rabbis didn't do that. Then Jesus describes the fact that when one blasphemes, she or he can be forgiven of her or his sin unless they blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, which is in Scripture the unforgivable sin. So, of course, we all want to know what does it mean to blaspheme against the Spirit. And quite frankly, scholars have struggled with this for generations. Theologians have tried to figure out exactly what it must mean if we blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, if that is the unforgivable sin. In Mark's Gospel, it says in verse 30, for they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Now, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit attributes the work of the Spirit of God to Satan. So if Satan is used in place of the Holy Spirit with regard to teachings, then we have an issue. Let me tell you what I mean by that. The Holy Spirit draws people to God. If the one who draws people to God is accused of being Satan, of being the prince of darkness, then one is referring to the spirit itself as dark. And if we reject the spirit of God, we have rejected God altogether, which does not make room for salvation. To blaspheme against the Holy Spirit scholars believe, as best we can determine, means that when we attribute to Satan that which God has really done, we are blaspheming the holy name of God. And we cannot be forgiven of that. We do not take that which is sacred and holy, as Scripture says, and throw it to the dogs. So that's about the best we can do with this blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit draws us to God, if we somehow accuse that spirit of being anything other than the pure undefiled love of God, then we have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Now notice what I said a minute ago. You now have the family of Jesus, which scripture tells us in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus has brothers and sisters. When they come into the presence of Jesus, they try to interrupt his teachings, to intervene, to restrain him. Were they trying to restrain him because they're so concerned about his teachings? Were they trying to restrain him because they're concerned about his physical well-being? Is it a combination of the two? We don't know exactly why it is, but we do know that immediately following their effort to restrain Jesus, Jesus is accused of being satanic in his approach to ministry by the religious establishment, which of course we know is an absurdity. Look at verse 31. Then his mother and his brothers came. Again, no mention of Joseph. Joseph has probably died. And standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him. Well, of course there was a crowd sitting around him. In the Gospel of Mark, there's always a crowd around Jesus. And they called him. The crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus says when he is confronted by those who tell him, Listen, your family's out here looking for you. Jesus says, My family, this is my family. My family is anybody who does the will of God. They're a part of the family. It's an extraordinary invitation by Jesus to welcome anyone into his family who chooses and longs to be in relationship with him. Now, interestingly enough, we know who two of Jesus' brothers are in Scripture, or if you will, half-brothers, because we know Jesus 
was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus' mother is Mary, of course. Mary had children. We see that. And in the New Testament, the writer of the book of James is Jesus' half-brother. If you flip over to the book of Jude, a small little book right before the book of Revelation, Jude says, I'm the brother of James. So we know that two of those who were with the crowd, who are trying to intervene into the ministry of Jesus, are James and Jude, author of two New Testament books written, obviously, later on. Two prominent figures in the early church and its ministry. Now what we see is something that Mark wants us to know, and that is Mark is building a number of themes in his gospel to kind of get us to be able to understand Jesus and to shape his ministry. We see that Jesus is radically different from any other rabbi. We see that Jesus is very almost impatient with regard to doing what he needs to get done he immediately goes from one place to the next, immediately touches somebody, somebody is immediately healed, and immediately he moves on. Jesus is, in the Gospel of Mark, if you will, kind of a type A, driven, impatient personality who has a limited amount of time to get all of his work done. Jesus tries to do his work, always having people breathing down his neck, always having people physically close to him, continually asking from him everything he has to be able to offer. He teaches there's a crowd. He tries to separate himself from the crowd to pray with very little success. Jesus travels from one place to another. There's a crowd that follows him or there's a crowd that meets him. And we are going to see in the Gospel of Mark eventually that the toll it takes on Jesus physically even is pretty extraordinary. But Jesus knows in the Gospel of Mark that he has got to preach and he has got to teach and there's a limited amount of time in which to get it all done. So we're going to see that now uh, in chapter 4. And in chapter 3 we have seen several instances where there are those who are concerned about Jesus, either concerned about his teachings because they're opposed to his teachings and offended by it, or concerned about it for some other reason, particularly his family. We're not sure why they are particularly concerned, but we do know that they have concerns. Jesus broadens his definition of what his family looks like in the third chapter. Chapter 4. Now we have Jesus teaching. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him. Of course, such a very large crowd gathered around him. We see that over and over again. That he got into a boat on the sea and sat there. Now remember, rabbis taught seated. When a rabbi would come gather around a group of people, people knew it was time for the teaching to begin when the rabbi was seated. And so Jesus, again, tries to separate himself to have a little distance from the crowd, gets into a boat, and he is seated. And it is upon his sitting down that people would have known in this moment his teaching is to begin. Well, the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables. And in the, his teaching, he said to them, Listen. That is a call to attention. Listen. We know parents do that with children. Listen to me. And we know that in the moment, the children's ears are perked up because they know that the expectation is they're paying attention. And that was the same with Jesus and the crowd of people. Listen. He says a sower went out to sow. Now, in a, an agrarian culture, people would have understood that. But Jesus is going to tell a rather unusual story about someone who sows seed. Seed being a precious commodity. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. So, 
And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. So we see that there are external conditions that render the seed either productive or not productive. We're going to find out in this parable. The other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up. Quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. Now the first thing that would have drawn the attention of the audience to the words of Jesus were how the sower, the farmer, if you will, distributed his seed. These people would have understood clearly how to distribute seed. It would have been important to do it in a meticulous manner to get the most out of every seedling. But we see the sower flinging it all over the place with little regard to where it lands. It lands on rocky soil. It lands on the ground. The birds quickly eat it. It lands in thorns and some of it lands in good soil. Well, what kind of farmer throws seed in every corner? And Jesus has said, listen. So these people would have been doubly interested in this particular parable because Jesus says, pay attention to me, and then tells a very unusual, strange story about an irresponsible farmer or sower of the seed. And then on conclusion, to the parable, Jesus says, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Now I want you, if you will, to flip to the book of Jeremiah. You may have to use your index. It's not too far back into the Old Testament from the Gospel of Mark. It is after Isaiah, if that's any help at all. So Jeremiah chapter 5, in verse 21, it says, as it is being expressed to the Israelites who have abandoned God, Jeremiah says this, Hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but do not see, who have ears but do not hear. And then the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 12, moving back toward the New Testament, just a few books, Ezekiel, chapter 12, Ezekiel says this, to the Israelite people who have also been extremely unfaithful to God. He makes this accusation regarding Judah's captivity. Who you who have eyes to see but do not see, who have ears to hear but do not hear. That's the second verse of the 12th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. So when we get to the Gospel of Mark, and Jesus says in verse 9, and he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Good faithful Jews would have understood that that kind of statement had been issued before. That that's not unique to Jesus. But what Jesus is saying here is listen to what I have to say. If you have ears, pay attention. Now we see something rather unusual. We're going to discover that Jesus makes it clear that there are going to be some who will hear and see, but never follow him. And in Mark's gospel, more so than Matthew and Luke, when Jesus tells a parable, because there are no parables in the gospel of John, but in Matthew and Luke, much more so in the gospel of Mark, Jesus has to give his disciples private instruction about what he's just said. It's a common theme in the Gospel of Mark. We see private instruction in chapters 4, 7, 9, 10, 12, and 13. Because the disciples don't just understand, even though they have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, Jesus has to separate them, and when he's alone with them, he has to explain to them the teachings that he has brought forth. We see that here. In verse 10 of chapter 4, when he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, that is the disciples, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, 
To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything comes in parables. That is, those outside the faith, this doesn't make a lot of sense, what Jesus tells. And in order that they may indeed look but not perceive and may indeed listen but not understand so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. It is the idea, Jesus says, that those outside are not going to understand because of their unwillingness to claim him as the one who is Lord. Their lack of understanding means they're going to lack forgiveness along the way. There is a level of spiritual shallowness on the part of the disciples, which is a theme in the Gospel of Mark. Because look at verse 13, Jesus speaking to the disciples, he says, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? There is this sense of frustration on the part of Jesus that his hand-picked closest companions don't understand him or his teachings. He says, the sower sows the word. So the sower is either Jesus and or his disciples who are going to have a responsibility to share the word. And the seed we are going to see is the message. So Jesus teaching, he's the sower, and he is slinging his message everywhere. That's why it starts to make sense now that the sower would sling it all over the place. You got to sling it everywhere in every crack and crevice and every corner along the way. The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, now notice this, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Satan immediately takes it away. That is, Jesus says there are going to be some people who are always unresponsive to the message. And in Mark's gospel, Jesus oftentimes fights Satan. So Jesus says that there are going to be those who hear the word. It never has a chance to take root. It's never going to grow and blossom and flourish because it never has a chance. There are going to be people out in the world, says Jesus, who are going to hear the gospel message and never respond accordingly. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy but they have no root and endure only for a while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Now Jesus tells us that there are those who are going to hear the word and they hear with enthusiasm and they hear with excitement, but when they face some kind of difficulty, immediately the word falls away. Now remember this, Jesus is writing to persecuted Roman Christians who face imprisonment or death or harassment at least. And Jesus says there are going to be those who hear my word, but things are going to get a little difficult for them, and immediately that word is just going to fall away. It's one of the ways in which Mark makes it clear to the early persecuted church, Jesus is watching you. And you have a chance now in my teachings to hear his word. Are you simply going to follow away when things get a little difficult? Or are you going to hang in there and keep responding? Verse 18, and others are those who, when the word is sown among the thorns, they're the ones who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire of other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. And those are the ones sown on the good soil, which is next. So here you have people who hear the word, but worldly possessions and other things take precedent over their relationship with the word and its development in their own life. And in the culture in which we have lived for a long time, we know that materialism can easily take away time that we are supposed to be in relationship with Christ, learning his word or we desire something that is so important to us that it takes precedent over our relationship with God. If I just get this, it's all I want, and then I'm happy. And I get that and understand it. Unfortunately, I've fallen prey to that many times. There are those things in life I think that if I just have that, that's all I need, I'm gonna be satisfied, and lo and behold, I get it, and before you know it, I need something else. It doesn't satisfy for the long haul. I used to want a truck 
regularly, a new pickup truck. And for years, I had a truck, then I would trade it in and get a new one. And I used to tell my kids when I was very, when they were very small, listen, don't eat in this truck. Don't you dare have anything in here that might dirty up my truck. And for a couple of weeks, that's how it was. My truck was pristine. I was so happy I didn't need anything else. And then lo and behold, the news started to wear off. It wasn't quite as exciting. And then I would look in my truck and there were french fries on the floorboard and there were melted crayons on the dashboard. And then I was off for something else. Because we know that worldly possessions don't ultimately satisfy or gratify us forever. We're always looking for something else. And Jesus says there are those kinds of people who when the word takes root in their life, they allow those other things to take precedent, become more important than their relationship with the messenger who is sowing the word. Then he said, there is those who sow the seed in good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Those are the people who hear the message of Jesus Christ and do something with it. One thing about our faith is, it's not an individual faith. It is a faith that we are to share. We don't keep it to ourselves. And Jesus says we can have this absurd, ridiculous amount of benefit for other people. It can do 30 and 60 and 100 times more than we could ever imagine. Jesus is using hyperbole here to stretch the point, which we see sometimes in the Gospels, to say that what we have the capacity to do to the world seems ridiculous. But for us, we can produce an abundance, an overflow, an excess to change the world and make it a better place. So we conclude our Bible study on the Gospel of Mark tonight in the fourth chapter, ending with verse 20. I appreciate you being a part of this, and I certainly hope that it is helpful for you as we continue to see some of the themes emerging from the Gospel of Mark and the teachings. The disciples don't seem to understand, but it doesn't keep Jesus from doing what he needs to do. We're going to learn more next week in several more parables that Jesus teaches about what it means to be one of his followers. I'm grateful for your time. Blessings to you.